It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. We all experience challenges in life. For some, it's difficult to express their feelings, and so they mask their hidden pain with substance abuse, anxiety, depression, isolation, or even violence. Today's guest, Matthew Quick, understands that pain. Matthew experienced a dark night of the soul after using alcohol and drugs to treat his extreme anxiety and depression. He got sober in 2018, only to experience five years of crippling writer's block. Matthew joins us today to talk about how he healed and what he learned. Matthew is a New York Times bestselling author of The Silver Linings Playbook, which was made into an Oscar-winning film. His other books include The Good Luck of Right Now, Love May Fail, and The Reason You're Alive. The Hollywood Reporter has named Matthew one of Hollywood's 25 most powerful authors. His new book is We Are the Light. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Matthew, I want to start off by talking a little bit about your backstory. What was it that you were experiencing in life that made you want to start self-medicating? Well, um, from an early age, even, I can remember even in elementary school, I I felt a sense of um, uneasiness in the world. um, And I think I wouldn't have called it anxiety at the time, but I think I was having, you know, even anxiety attacks in in elementary school. And as I... um, you know, got older and became a teenager, this this started to become apparent that things were happening to me inside of me that I suspected weren't happening with a lot of my friends. And, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of talk about mental health. So I didn't know I had an anxiety disorder. I didn't know, um, you know, I knew that I was sad from time to time, but I, I didn't really think of myself as like a depressed person uh, but when I started to drink in college, um, it helped a lot. And I found that if I was in a social setting and I had a few drinks, I could survive in a way that um, would allow me to stay there. Whereas if I didn't, um, I would probably leave the party. So it became um, apparent to me that there was something going on inside of me that I didn't quite understand. And alcohol was the socially acceptable way to to manage that for many, many years for me. I've spoken with a number of people recently who have gone through recovery, and they all shared a, a similar type of story as to why they began to drink. Some of them had even said that after they had their first drink, they, they felt like, huh, this is what normal people must feel like. Did, did you have that same experience? Yes. Um, it was more, it was just such a relief, you know, um, alcohol, you know, and I, having a drink at night after a day of anxiety and watching all of the anxiety go away, it was just such a respite. And it just felt like I could breathe. Um, my, my mind would just kind of shut off. I remember reading in the Tennessee Williams play about, you know, the character, I think it was Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. He he talks about drinking until he hears the click in his mind. And I I remember when I read that line thinking, yes, like that's exactly right. Um, You would drink until something would turn in your mind and you would be free of all of the pain and the anxiety and and, um, the obsessive thinking. Um, So, you know, when I discovered that in college, it was, It was really um, like opening a door into um, a safe space. Uh, You know, it was like an exit from from the pain. Um, And, you know, again, I I wasn't conscious. I think I just kind of intuitively knew that this felt like relief and I didn't question it much because 
uh, of course, on a college campus, getting drunk is what you do. Um, mm-hmm. So it was hurra- hooray for me, you know, like I have this this relief and also it's what everyone else is doing. So um, there it is. And, you know, I, I became a high school English teacher and, you know, there's a, there's a pretty strong uh, drinking culture amongst teachers and there is a pretty strong drinking culture amongst writers. So it was not out of the ordinary for me as a teacher, of course, never in school, but afterwards to go to the bar with other teachers and to have drinks. And Mm -hmm. of course, in the writing community, it's just, you're expected to drink at all times, you know, everything you do in the writing community has, has alcohol involved. So it it was something that um, I, I don't think I consciously admitted how much I relied on it. It was something that I needed. You know, when I would walk into a social setting, I needed a drink in my hand immediately. Mm-hmm. Like that was, that was, that was something that I didn't come to terms with until my forties. You know, and in my twenties and thirties, I I just pretended like, well, this is normal. This is everyone has a drink at the party. It's fine. But for me, it was something I needed. It wasn't something that I was enjoying. It wasn't something that um, I particularly even liked. It was it was a requirement, right. uh, and that was that was something that I didn't, I didn't really understand that was a problem uh, until my mid forties. Well, and you had such a successful career as well. I mean, look at the work that you were doing while you were drinking. Do you think that that in some way it helped with your creative process? Yes, um, I, I, I do. And, you know, I, I've recently kind of put together as I've thought about this a lot in, in the, the, I mean, I'm in Jungian analysis and, you know, the analysis I do, I've been thinking about this and trying to go back, but I, I grew up in a very religious household. Um, and when I left that household, I also left the church of my childhood. And that is exactly when I started drinking. And so I, I've thought a lot about how, um, you know, the religion of my childhood, which was um, fundamentalist Christianity, you know, was really you know, whatever you think about that, it was a place for me to engage with transcendence. It was a place for me to engage with the divine. And alcohol is very, um, you know, aptly named a spirit, you know, and, you know, people in AA know, and Jung was very involved in creating AA, that in order to beat alcoholism, you have to reach for a higher power. And so I think subconsciously, my drinking attempt was an attempt to replace the the transcendent experience of my religious experience as a child. And I think in my writing, um, I'm always trying to reach for something more. I'm always trying to reach for ecstasy. I'm always trying to reach for transcendence. I'm always trying to reach for, for these larger things that are bigger than us. And alcohol was a shortcut to get there often. Um, you know, that sense of transcendence, that sense of delivery, that sense of freedom, um, that sense of ecstasy. Uh, I could get that with three or four scotches at night. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it might have been a cheap imitation of that. But, you know, I, I do think that um, particularly even in the religion of my, my childhood, every Sunday we'd have communion and we were supposed to drink the, the blood of Christ, which was the wine. You know, we dr- were drinking grape juice in a Protestant church, but you know, just even the fact that that was tied to alcohol, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's something there. And I think in my creative process, um, you know, creatives, particularly novelists, you, you're trying to do something that is virtually impossible. You know, making a living as a novelist is, is a very, very hard thing to do. The odds are against you at every step. Uh, and there are a lot of voices in your head and there are a lot of, a lot of demons speaking to you and you know, imposter syndrome and all of that. And alcohol is a very good way to find courage. You know, I'm not saying that it's a good way in terms of people should do it, but you know, it, it does remove doubt. And I think at the end of the day, having that escape route into alcohol really was necessary for me because I hadn't done the emotional and inner work that I needed to take care of those inner voices in a different way. Right. So again, it was, it was a functional, you know, it had a purpose and, and for a while it, it allowed me to, to, you know, use my ego to kind of just bull through a lot of stuff and not look at the pain inside of me not look at the hurts inside of me. But at some point, you know, um, if you're lucky enough to have some success as, a, as an artist, 
and you get some of the things that you you're dreaming from for and you know this is a story that many people have told you know you you have that day where you're sitting at the oscars you know with your your book being adapted into a movie and you think oh is is this it you know this is what i was you know i don't feel better like it didn't solve all the pain inside of me i still have all these broken places and when you when you have that type of mountaintop experience and you realize this thing that's been driving you is not fixed by the success it's not fixed with money or or um, any type of accomplishment then that you know for me it led to a kind of crisis where i said oh you know like external things are not going to fix the broken things inside of me i've got to go inside of myself and do this yeah. internal work which is really humbling um and terrifying you know it's like this this five years of writer's block were, were were just a terrifying experience of of you know not being able to you know blame the external world for things and kind of reclaiming and saying no this this is about things that are going on inside of me and i need to look in the mirror and i need to fix these things but that's such a great point matthew because if you look at most people today they're always looking for that external validation or those things outside of themselves, the bigger home, the fancier car, the more powerful job. It's it's all those things that once you attain, like you said, I mean, you had the ultimate experience sitting at the Oscars, but once you achieve it, then you say to yourself, well, I'm still not happy. And you're right. It is painful to go within and have to fix what's broken inside of us. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, it was it was shocking to me at the Oscars, too, to see how many A-list celebrities with the camera on were all smiles and happy and looking glamorous. And with the camera off, their heads were down and they were shaking because it's such an intense experience and they were exhausted. And, um, you know, oftentimes these things that we think that we want, um, you know, I've seen many famous people uh, off camera you know they're not as happy as they appear on camera and and some people are I'm not I'm not trying to make a sweeping statement but I think you know we live in a culture that glamorizes the external and kind of doesn't really pay as much attention to what's going on inside of individuals Um, and I, I think that that is definitely linked to this mental health crisis that we're having um you know, it's it's one thing to look good on the Internet. It's another thing to be at peace with who you are inside of yourself. Um, and we we really reward the first and we, we don't even really pay much attention to the second. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I chased that dragon for a long time. You know, I, I did the social media. You know, I tried to get the likes. I, I tried to figure out, like, who I was supposed to be um, for for whatever audience and you know i think you get to a point particularly for me in in midlife where you kind of have that moment where you realize like this is never going to make me feel better Mm -hmm. and when i had that moment it was it was terrifying because i didn't know what else to do um and i think those five years were really uh, a wrestling match with my soul of uh, you know uh, i had to figure out a way to get humble and ask for help and start finding a way to go inside and fix those broken places. Why do you think you didn't give up when you had that writer's block? Most people would have said, I'm done with writing. I can't do this. What made you keep moving forward? I think honestly, I didn't know what else to do. (laughs) I am, you know, I'm, I'm a deeply introverted person and, um, you know, I, I love writing. I love sitting in a room alone and trying to figure things out. Um, I also think that, you know, I had the support of my wife, you know, and she was encouraging me. And and I felt as though there was something that I needed to say yet, and I just didn't know how to say it. And so it was this kind of puzzle that I was trying to figure out that I was obsessed with. But I do think that the writing is, is inherently linked to my mental health. And so... I've always taken my mental health problems and tried to drag them into the creative writing wrestling ring and wrestle them down onto the page. And so all of my books are born out of that process. Mm-hmm. And so I think that um, I was continuing to fight to manifest the best of me into the world. And there are times when I didn't think I was going to make it through that process. Um, it was a very dark night of the soul. 
but I just kept trying. I kept putting one psychological foot in front of the other. Um, and, you know, it, it, I don't want to glamorize it or, you know, suggest that it was heroic because many days it was the extreme opposite of that. Um, but there was just something in me that just kept, that didn't want to give up on, on, on me. It was less about trying to put a book in the world and more just about trying to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life and mm-hmm. who I was supposed to be. So your new book, then, We Are the Light, this is really a healing journey for you, and it must be very important for you. And what do those words mean to you, We Are the Light? Well, um, I think, you know, they mean a lot of things, but without getting into spoilers in the book, I, I really think the the emphasis is on the word the word we, you know, I think we're all looking for light when we're in the darkness. And, you know, like I said earlier, um, when I was a young man, I kept thinking the light must be out there. Who has it? You know, um, I need to find that person and earn it. You know, I I need to go make some type of arrangement with the external world out there and, and get the light that I need. But I think that the journey I've been on, and particularly the Jungian work I've been doing, I'm realizing that, oh, no, no, the light is inside of all of us. You know, it's we have it within us. Like, we are the light. It's not something else that's external out there. It's us. Like, it's it's on us to do this work and to figure this out. And, you know, a part of my healing journey, you know, when I was drinking a lot, um, I would get angry and I would blame my problems on other people. And I would try to paint myself you know, mentally, if not, you know, or privately, if not publicly, as some type of victim. Well, mm-hmm. this must be because this happened in my childhood, or this must be because I'm not the right type of person for the zeitgeist right now, or this must be because these types of people don't like me. But really, um, that was all just nonsense. And uh, really what it came down to is I didn't want to look at um, my shadow elements, the things that were keeping me from making connections in the world. It was It was always me. You know, and that that is both a, a really humbling and awful realization, but it's also an incredibly empowering realization that, you know, well, you, you know, I was also an alcoholic and drinking too much the whole time, too. So maybe that had something to do with, you know, me not obtaining the things or making the connections that I want. Um, and also like having a bitter, resentful attitude, however you, you mask that, that, that creates a certain energy that you project into the world. and. And uh, what I've been learning through the Jungian work I've been doing is that, you know, the, the face you put towards the world is often the face that, that is reflected back to you. And it's simple, you know, even on book tour, I've been, I don't like airports at all. And I've been in a lot of airports the last um, couple of weeks. And I've been really practicing, you know, not going into the airport with the attitude of, I hate being here, but going into the airport and saying, you know, everyone's in the same situation. Let me try to have a nice conversation with people around me. Let me try to smile at people. Let me try to be polite. And I can't tell you how much that has radically transformed my airport experience. All of a sudden I'm finding people are being nice to me and smiling back at me. And, uh, you know, it's not a hundred percent, but you know, this experiment that I've been doing really has underscored the fact that, you know, the attitude that I'm bringing to situations is often creating the situation um, or at least coloring the situation. And that was something that I really didn't see, um, you know, when I would go to the airport and immediately go to the bar and drink three scotches before I got on a plane or whatever, you know, um, Mm -hmm. this this is a new thing for me. And it's very empowering. Um, It it requires being humble. With the way you're feeling now, Matthew, with the work that you've been doing, do you still have the desire to drink? Do you, are there times when you fear you may relapse? You know, it's interesting. I had a dream last night um, where I had a drink, and I felt extremely guilty about it in the dream. And I woke up thinking, why did I have that dream? You know, we do a lot of dream analysis and, and Jungian analysis. I, I don't consciously have that um you know, um, yearning to drink. Like I can be in a bar or I can be around other people who are drinking, but I often have to have a seltzer in my hand. It's mm-hmm. it's a weird psychological thing that um, if I'm around people who are drinking, I will consume a massive amount of seltzer, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. But I think there is some part of me that still yearns for that escape into transcendence, that, that quick fix. Um, and so I, I monitor it. You know, and I, I'm aware of it. I don't think it's something that ever goes away. Um, but I, I try to have a healthy relationship with that 
that part of me, you know, that shadow side of me and respect it. And what's going on now with your creative process? Do you feel that it's opened up again? Yeah, um, I, I don't know that I would use the word open up. I feel like I'm being I'm being receptive again. Like um, it's almost like if I'm an antenna, I'm, I'm receiving the frequency again. You mm-hmm. know, I've fixed that antenna. Um, and so, yeah, I'm working on this screenplay for We Are the Light, and I have another novel I'm working on. And um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to really monitor my relationship to those projects and not fall into old old traps. But it, it's going well, and I feel like it's going at, at the pace. Um, that it should be going. And I'm trying to be grateful for the work that's in front of me. And uh, again, just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, you know, seeing what shows up, what opportunities and being very grateful for them. But I have to say that in my sobriety now, I I do find that my my relationships, my professional relationships have really um, deepened in a very surprising and beautiful way. And, you know, I, I feel the clear, the more clear I get and the more conscious I am of what I'm putting out into the world, uh, I feel that other people um, who, who work with writers such as me are, are, are really kind of, they're, they're, they're seeing that, they're getting that frequency and the right people are showing up in really great ways. So it's been, it's been a positive experience that way. And, um, you know, as, as I go, I'm four and a half years sober now. As I keep going down this road, I, I see um, so much of what I was missing out on earlier, or so much for, that uh, I just didn't have, uh, you know, a, a sober appreciation for. So it's been good. And Matthew, what do you hope people take away from We Are the Light? You know, people have been asking me this. The first time uh, um, someone asked me this about a month ago, I, I really paused for a second and I thought about this. And I, I just kind of spontaneously said, uh, I want readers to, to know that they are worthy of receiving and giving love. And I think the book is about radical love. Um, you know, in, in this time in our country, we're talking a lot about power. And, you know, those conversations are really important, you know, and I think we have to have conversations about power. But I think we also need to have conversations about love without relegating it. You know, I think we have to keep them on an even scale there, you know. And, and I think sometimes as we talk about power, we kind of relegate conversations of love. And, and so I think that this book is an effort to restore those conversations and lift them up a little bit. Um, because I think we are all worthy of giving and receiving love. And I think that that is, that is something that... Um, needs to be underscored these days. The book is We Are the Light. If you would like to get more information about Matthew and his work, you can visit MatthewQuickWriter.com. Matthew, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I really appreciate you sharing so much of what you've experienced, and I truly believe it's going to impact so many lives, and I'm honored that you were here to share this with us. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.